finding purpose, finding purpose in our lives. Boy, I tell you, that is one thing that, it's really exciting to find a purpose for something, isn't it? It's really exciting. I don't know. We, we, um, many of you guys probably have had this before. I, I try to save lumber. And I save lumber because one day I'm going to find a purpose for it, you know? I save a two-by-four, a piece of plywood, and, uh, and, I, and it's just a small scrap. But it's valuable. And, you know, in a mind, maybe like mine and maybe like you men, we, we quantify that value. We say that four-by-eight sheet of plywood that is now half the sheet is still $15. And so when you find a purpose for that, you just rejoice, don't you? You get so excited, and you're like, yes, I found a purpose for this thing. And even though you've had it for several years and you've moved it from one place to the next and you had to clean out that side of the garage and you move it to the other side of the garage and finally you find a purpose and you're just just elated you know i don't know maybe you women are the same way when it comes to maybe things in the kitchen or i don't know things that pertain more to the home but us guys we get excited and, and i think that you ladies would agree that when you find a purpose for something it's wonderful it's wonderful and when i think of our lives and our lives are so are so can, can be so boring they can, they can just be the, what I referred to last week, the rat race. Where we feel like that little hamster in the wheel just keep going around and around and around and around. Really with no destination, you know? We want to reach a goal, don't we? We want to, we want to, get, to a, get to a point in our lives. And one of the coolest things is uh, entering your destination into the GPS and watching it count down. You know, and you see that you're making progress. And unless you're going a long distance, and then it's just, you know, disaster because you're staring at the thing, you know. It just seems to never, ever reduce. But anyway, we love to find a purpose. We love to have a destination. We want to have a goal. And so that's what the topic of finding purpose is all about. It's about finding purpose in your life. Finding a goal, something that you can reach for, strive for, you can go toward. You can try to achieve in your life. Something worse than just wandering around with no destination, no purpose. And I enjoy that. When I, when I actually look at the Word of God, I get excited because it gives me a, a, a place to go. It gives me a destination. Last week, we started by talking about the purpose of purpose. The purpose of purpose. I mentioned to you how finding something impacts you. I mentioned what purpose, what purpose is. And purpose is simple, really. It's the what question. Purpose is what are we doing? What is the end result, the goal? I mentioned to you that the purpose of purpose does three things, three main things. It brings clarity to your life. Number one, it keeps you focused, and it adds a passion. It adds a passion. You know, there are some people who, who are just excited all the time, you know? I would like to think that I'm kind of one of those people. I mean, I, I generally, I wake up in the morning and, and I'm excited. I'm excited, to, I'm excited to get out of bed, you know? I'm excited to wake up. I'm excited to get moving, get the blood flowing. I'm just, I, I can be excited and, and sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I get a little over the top, don't I? And, and you all know because I get excited and Joel edits my sermons and he's got the door shut in the back, and I'm in my office with my door shut, and I'm hearing myself get excited and yell, and it's like, who is this guy? And what is he so excited about anyway? Why does he have so much passion for what he does? Because I have a purpose. Because I have a purpose in my life, and I can be excited about that. You know, some of the funnest things, you, you go out to a, a, a baseball game or a football game, basketball game, and you see some of the people you've never seen come unglued, they get on their chair. And they're shouting at the top of their lungs, and they're excited, and they just, they're just, go, 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 go. And you're just like, I've never seen this in you before. And there you are, standing on your chair. You know what I'm talking about. Where they tell a story, and they get really excited about it. And see, sometimes passion is what gets us to our purpose. It kind of is what propels us down, down the road. And that's what we're talking about this morning, the purpose of passion. 
the purpose of passion. And as it pertains to purpose, I think passion is lost in the church and just in America. Unless you get a, a sports game going, then in some cases you have kind of too much passion. But passion can be sometimes hard to explain. And as one person put it this way, it's obvious that we can no more explain a passion to a person who has never experienced it than we can explain light to the blind. How do you get somebody's fire going anyway? How do you get somebody to, to really get excited about something? How do, you get a, how do you get a fire in their belly and get them excited and get them just wound up? Well, I think I'll give you an illustration. Many of you guys are probably like me, and when you look through pictures, you look through pictures, right? You don't look at the pictures. You find the one you're looking for, and that's the one that you're excited about. Right? You have a fishing trip, you guys, and you're saying, uh, you're looking through, and you're like, there, here's a picture. Okay, there we are fishing. There we are. Uh, we got wet. There we are. We're in the boat. There it is. There's the fish. There it is. And you enlarge that picture like that. Yeah. Yeah, I do the same thing with our wedding pictures. And uh, I, I think about how many times my wife has sat at the table and showed someone the wedding pictures. And uh, we don't do it all the time, but she does it a whole lot more often than I do. And so, uh, so she looks at these pictures. And of course, when you pull out a picture, a photo album of a wedding, what's a guy to think? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm fatter. I'm older, more bald. You know, I don't want to reminisce in that. So I don't have any, there's no purpose for looking through a wedding album except for one purpose for me. No, come on. Not the bride. The cake, the wedding cake. <laughs> Our wedding cake had fed 1,200 people. I mean, you should have seen this thing. It was huge. The table that it was sitting on, it had a bow. It had two eight-foot tables slammed together, and it was a bow. I talked to the baker and I said, tell me some statistics. And he says, there are 55 pounds of sugar in this thing. <laughs> like, you're kidding me. That's crazy. You could feed an army with this. I was really excited. So when I look through pictures, I find the one because, you know, it's hard to get just excited about just the picture. So you find the one you're looking for. You get really excited about it. And you say, there it is. That's the fish I caught. There it is. You see, you see, that's the wedding cake. Hard to find passion when you can't find a purpose, though. There are two primary things that passion adds to your life. Two primary things. Now, there's a variety of things, but two primary things. First of all, it adds productivity. It adds productivity. Passion adds and drives productivity. And the second thing is it adds and creates persuasion. It adds and creates persuasion. So let's talk about these two things. First of all, passion creates productivity. Now, to some extent, we all want to be productive. Just maybe not all to the same extent. We all have a, a desire to get things done. I think. I think we do. I think we do. I think whether it's at, at home or whether or not it's at work. We all got, we all got things we got to do when we go home, right? It's like, man, we got to go home, and, 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 and we got to do this, and I want to do this, and we got to do this. And then you say, I got to go to work, and I have this project, and I got that project, and I got this project. Maybe with your families, you have, this, uh, you have some, uh, a, a desire to do something, right? We all have the to-do list, right? It's the laundry list that nothing ever gets done. I think if I said, how many of you all have a to-do list? You'd all raise your hand. And if I said, how many of you are effective in getting all the things on your to-do list done? You'd say, well, probably not very many people. We all have them. We all have these, these 10 or 20 long items of things. We've got to do this. Uh, whether we have, we, have to, we have to paint the door, we have to mow the grass, and we, we, we go down this whole list. We all have a desire to get things done to some extent. We all want to see a result. And what passion does is it, it creates productivity. It creates productivity. And that's important. I think we were created in the image of God. 
I know we were created in the image of God. And when I look back at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, that, and God said, let us make man in our image. You know what? For the first 25 verses of Genesis, God had been creating and he had been productive and, 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 and even efficient in what he was doing. He, was, he had passion behind what he was doing, didn't he? Now, does it say that in the, in the Hebrew? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't. I could tell you that, and then you'd have to just go, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it says it right there in the Hebrew in, in verse 4. Passion. No, it doesn't. But we know that he had passion. There was an excitement to create the world, to create the universe. And his passion drove productivity. It made him to get things done because he was excited about it. Now, I think that while we all, to some extent, want to get things done, some of us are lazy. And uh, I can be lazy with the best of them. It's not easy for me to be lazy, but sometimes I can be lazy. Right, honey? Sure. See, she's not agreeing with me. She's not agreeing with me. Max, you can be lazy? Oh, yeah. Can you? <laughs> really? Is this true, Beth? <laughs> lazy begins with an old Western. I'm going to make a note of that real quick. Usually when an old Western comes on, it turns off. <laughs> because I don't do those black and whites. I just don't believe in them. I think it's not found in the Bible. <laughs> passion is a powerful thing. Passion is a powerful thing. The more passion that a person has, generally, the more that's going to be produced. When you find someone who has a passion for what their purpose is, you're going to find someone striving, someone working hard. Someone who is, is literally turning the world upside down. As a matter of fact, in Acts 17, we see a story, a record of someone turning the world upside down. Up until this point, in Acts 17, we see Paul on the scene in Acts chapter 9. He gets converted. Guy gets gloriously saved. We see his first missionary journey start shortly thereafter that. His second missionary journey starts in chapter 15 and goes through 18. And we see him literally in the Roman Empire, all of Asia Minor, preaching the gospel of God. He is literally out there preaching nonstop, trying to reason with people out of the scriptures. It says this, beginning in verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks and a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few, but the Jews which believe not. Here you go, you have some Jews now, you got some people who are moving with envy. They're angry, they're upset. They took unto themselves certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying. Now, this is what they're saying. They, they bring out these believers. And here's the testimony of Paul's passion. These that have turned the world upside down are come hitherto. Now, that's amazing. Why is it that Paul did what he did? He had a goal, he had a purpose in his life, and he had some guts behind it to get out and get the job done. He had a passion. Now, a person can have a purpose and essentially have no passion and get nothing done, but the passion is the motor that propels it. That's what gets it done. It's a desire. And friends, when we talk about purpose in our lives, we also ought to have passion. There, there, there is, in general, apathy for Christ. There's apathy. 
Apathy is, well, I don't really care. And there needs to be excitement. And we're going to talk about the persuasion in just a moment. Passion is powerful. We look at the Apostle John and what he did. And the Apostle Peter and what he did. And we look at the testimony of all the disciples in the Scripture. And what you find is you find a soul-stirring burden to win the world for something, for someone. And excitement. And and man, it's just it, it changed the world. Literally turned the world upside down. Because of his passion. You know, the people who do things in America on a secular level are not the ones who are the the proverbial, what do you call them? Oh, bump on a log. They're the ones out there who are are the pace setters. They're the market makers, the ones that get out there and, and hustle. Those are the ones that get it done. And when we think about our purpose in life, when we think about our goal, what is the end result? What's over there? The way that I get from here over there is not by staying here. It's by... It's by moving along a line and being excited about something and having passion in your life. What was it that the, all these men had in common? When it, comes to, when it comes to faith, when it comes to purpose, what is it that all these men had, had in common? They were moved by God. And essentially, they all saw God's miracles work firsthand. They, they, they were so turned on by this because they could see God and they, 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 had a, they, they, they felt him in their life and they were moved so deeply by it that they couldn't stand still. That it would have been an offense and, and, and it, would have, it would have brought reproach. The Son of God moves in your life and you don't move. These people, these men and women of the scripture and men and women throughout all the past, they were so excited about God. And isn't it true? Even to this day that when you experience God in your life, you are moved passionately. When you see God do something in your life or in other people's lives, it moves you passionately. Passion is so powerful in our lives. And we need to get a handle on this. We can't, we, can't, we can't remain silent anymore. There's a lot of apathy. And I'm saying in the church, not just this church. And I'm not even saying this church. I think that this is a great church. But I'm saying that the church as a whole has become apathetic. Where people aren't really excited and aren't forthright, aren't bold proclaiming the gospel. Passion has to be proper. Not only is passion powerful, but passion has to be proper. It has to be properly placed. Now this is important. We need to make sure that we rightly apply our passion because improperly allocated passion, listen to this, may result in unproductive effort. If you put the emphasis in the wrong area, if you're excited about the wrong thing, the wrong thing gets done. When I think of um, efficiency, when I think of productivity, when I think about that to-do list, right? We all have a to- I think we all have a to-do list. You all have a mental to-do list anyway, right? Say, nod, yes. Yes, okay. You all have at least some desire and something penciled down, and I've talked about this before, that my wife is the queen of this. She'll actually put stuff down on her list to cross it off, even though it's been done. But we won't bring that up again. I like, it. I like to know what it is I need to be doing. So, so we have lists, right? So let's just say, for instance, we have 10 items on this list. This is called the 80-20 rule. I've mentioned this before, too. The 80-20 rule. And that is that, that 80% of the effect is a result of 20% of the effort. Or better put, that 20% of the effort produces 80% of the results, right? So the passion has to be in a smaller area for this big list, and you get more done. 
And so if we are emphasizing, if we are putting our passion and our heart's desire, and we are really working on something that really is not going to have a bottom line effect, then what are we doing? We see this when it comes to salvation. We see this when it comes to salvation, right? We, we, we have this, this desire. I think it's put in us to know God. So what do we do? We, we, we go to church. We, we, we pray. We look out into the heavens and we see that there must be a God. And we try to do all of these things. We try to do all of these things that might somehow manifest or create merit for us to God, right? We, we are trying to do the best that we can do. So our passion is doing the best that we can do. Which if we're doing the best that we can do, we're not applying our passion in the right area because it's not about what we can do, it's about what God has done. A lot of people say that. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church a lot. And that's all well and good, and we should be doing that. I, th- I think that being a good person is good. I think that going to church a lot is good. But if our passion is, is, is forced into this idea that it's, it's, in the, it's, it's in us, then we have a problem. And that's where these are great verses in Romans 4. Or Romans 4 uh, verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. This is the I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps kind of mentality. This is, I'm going to put a whole lot of emphasis and a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of passion in an area that doesn't produce anything. Have you ever tried to lift yourself up by your bootstraps? It doesn't work. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. We have to make sure that our passion is in the right area, and that's where the second verse comes in, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, his faith is what's counted for righteousness, not his work, The passion has to be in the right area. And when our passion is in the right area, it can produce the right result. We have to have properly placed passion. It has to be properly placed. And then we can have productivity. Something can happen that's worthwhile. Friends, we have a deficit. See, when, when we talk about the purpose for passion, the purpose for passion is what creates productivity. But it does more than that. Passion is crucial for persuasion. Passion is crucial for persuasion. I've often said that I could never sell a product that I wasn't sold on. I can't get excited about something I'm not sold on. How, how, do, how, do, you, how do you do that? How, 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 do, how does a person live in the realm of this kind of a fallacious type. I can't get excited about something I can't, I, that doesn't excite me. You know? I mean, word of God, it's, it's just, it, it excites me. The Bible, the scripture, the, to know that God is speaking to me, that excites me. I absolutely love that. The reason why I'm so passionate about what I'm passionate about is because I believe so much in it. I believe so much in it. And that doesn't even doesn't even touch some of, the, some of the reformers, some of the ones who were burned at the stake for what they believed. I mean, those guys had a passion that we can't even touch. I mean, those guys were crazy. I mean, burning at the stake, singing songs and, and uh, reciting scripture. I mean, that's passion. I wish we could all, well, not burn at the stake, but I wish we could all have that same passion. We should all be driven by that same excitement that this is so real. These guys knew it was real. They knew it was real. And they had conviction. One person says, if you don't love what you do, you won't do it with much conviction or passion. You don't love what you do. And I just, I just love what I do. And that's why I can teach with conviction and passion. Because I believe it wholeheartedly. I love it. I couldn't persuade someone if I was not persuaded myself. You know, Paul was persuaded because he was passionate. It's why. He was persuasive, rather, because he was passionate. Paul knew that what he believed was true. He didn't have to second guess it. 
He didn't have to. He didn't have to make a game out of it. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. Uh, you know, ask too many questions. He knew it because he he was he had revelation by God. He knew it. He was excited. He could go out there and he could be beaten and he could be imprisoned and he could be excited because what he knew was true. And that came across in his persuasive ability. And he knew that, as a matter of fact, uh, he knew that we were all going to be judged for our deeds. So he, uh, and this was sobering to him, 2 Corinthians, he said this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to as he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Listen to this. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in our consciousness. Now listen, this is, this, when, I think of, when I think of his ability to persuade, he persuaded because he knew the terror. That word terror is the word where we get our word phobia from, the fear. He knew the fear of the Lord. He knew that one day we were all going to stand before God. And because he knew that one day we were all going to stand before God, he was able to persuade people. He had passion. He was convincing. You know, Paul was convincing because he was convinced. He was convincing because he was convinced. I think that's why God used him so mightily. He was able to go out and to preach the gospel and to teach and to reason and to be beat down and all of these things because he was so convinced it was true. And we think about our purpose and we think about what drives our purpose. And here's what happens. Because we don't have a purpose in life, we have no passion behind it. You see what I'm saying? We have nothing that really excites us because we don't know where we're going. And so when I think about finding purpose in life, we have to know the destination so that we can have the excitement to get us there. And as, and as we have that excitement, we are going to persuade people along the way that what we're saying is real, that God is real, that what we're saying is true, that the Bible is real, it's alive. We can be excited about it. I, I, I've heard people speak on biblical things where I have to ask the question. I'm like, this, this guy doesn't even believe it. It's not coming across like he even believes it. It's like he just doesn't have it in the gut. And, and in the following weeks, as we begin to talk about our family, the purpose for our family, whether it be our, 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 our children or our, uh, our wives, our husbands, our work, our church, our faith, all of these things. As we begin to, to, to dissect all these, we begin to look through all of these things, you'll find real quickly that it's hard to raise a family with passion if you don't understand the purpose of the family. How do you go to work if you're just going to work just to... If, 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 if the whole goal of work is just to put food on the table, it's hard to... Hard to be excited about going to work. You know, you're in that little, rat, you know, little hamster wheel. You have no passion because of it. Now, Paul gives uh, some instructions to Titus as to the qualifications of ministers in Titus chapter 1. And one of the qualifications is to hold fast the faithful word as he had been taught in order that he may be able to convince the gainsayer. Here's what he says. Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. That he may, listen to this, be able by sound doctrine, sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. You see, friends, you won't convince or persuade someone of the truth if you're not adhering to the truth yourself. How, How can I convince you of something that I'm not participating in? It's, it's almost impossible. And, that's was, and that was Paul's letter to Timoth- or Titus saying, listen, you by sound doctrine 
may be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayer that you can persuade them. And quite frankly, you won't adhere to what you're not passionate about. You're not going to be doing it very long. You'll have a, a glimpse of, of success at times. At times a person will have a glimpse of success. But the ones who are getting it done, who have found purpose in their life and are successful in arriving at the destination are the people who have passion behind their purpose. The purpose for passion motivates. It gets us going. Boy, if I, if I just had to wake up in the morning and go to work, and I mean, I would, I, would, I would get here right on time, and I would leave right on time. I wouldn't be excited about it. I wouldn't put in any extra time. I would just be kind of placid, you know? Like, I'm just normal. Nobody wants to live like that. Nobody wants to live with just a status quo, lukewarm, meager, just, you know, a, 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 a base, just nothing. That's why it's so cool to see people get excited, isn't it? It's so cool when you see people get really excited about something and they just get on fire. Listen, I think they're crazy, the, the guys that wear the big cheese things on their head during the Green Bay Packer thing, and they got the big piece of cheese. I think it's crazy. Where I'm from back in Minnesota... These guys, the Vikings, these guys would have their shirts off and they'd paint their bodies purple. And they'd wear, you'd wear these helmets and paint half their faces. And I'm just like, these guys are crazy. But that is so cool. You can be so excited about something that doesn't mean one thing, you know? And I just get excited because it's like, I wish, I wish the church could be infected with that same sort of passion. Unfortunately, so oftentimes we're not. It's true. It's true. Those guys are crazy. Crazy. Wearing cheese on your head. You ever see a guy with a cheese fight a guy who looked like a Viking? I mean, these guys are crazy. How about those, uh, what do you call them? The mascots? Crazy people. They just love doing the mascot thing. You ever see somebody who's a, who is like the big bear and then you see them when they're out of, out of character? I never have. I'm just curious if you have. <laughs> I just wonder if they're just excited about life all the time, you know? Or if they just run around, you know, like a big clown. You know, clowns are kind of creepy nowadays, but I won't go into that. Passion is, cru is crucial for persuasion. If you want to persuade people, you've got to have passion. You gotta be excited about what it is you believe. Find your, finding your purpose is great, then we need to embrace it. In conclusion, I just want to say that uh, we need to get a fire in our belly. We get excited about this. We gotta have a smile and a song and a bounce in our step. Man, we just gotta get excited. You know? God has done great things. God has done so many, so many great things. And it's fun to see people who have been touched by that. Because those are the ones that are out there turning the world upside down. I don't want to live a meager, baseline, rat race life. I want to be excited about something. I want to be excited about something. I want to, be, I want, I want to have a smile and a song. And, and I just, I want to be excited. But you're never going to be excited if you don't find your purpose. And when you begin to find your purpose, I promise you this. I promise you this. When you begin to know why you're here on earth, okay, in this room with these people, when you begin to realize, when you get to figure that out, like, I know what it is I'm supposed to do. I know what it is I'm supposed to do. Man, I tell you, that's when you get amped up. That's when you get excited. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, it'll, it'll make you work 20 hours a week and 20 hours a week? Never mind. You guys missed that one. So 20 hours a day when you just get excited, you know? And nothing will hold you back. Paul, he says, it says, it says I am unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Awesome. 
Unashamed of it. Why was he unashamed of it? He was passionate because he knew that was his purpose in life. He knew that giving the gospel was his purpose in life. And we're going to talk about that when it comes to our faith. When it comes to church. Because I want to, I want to cover all these things. Super important. We've got to have passion in our lives. That's what motivates us. Now friends, if you're here today and you don't have passion in your life, Boy, we got to find your purpose. We got to find purpose and then reinforce that with passion. We can get excited about it. You get excited where, where you don't have to just be placid all the time. You don't have to just be blah. Now, if you're blah, I'm not saying, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm just saying we can be less blah. Right? We can be less blah. We can be more blah, you know? <laughs> If I'm going to be blah, I'm going to be excited about it. You know? <laughs> so what's your purpose in life? I don't know, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> anyway, I think everyone here today knows Christ as their Savior. I saw the coolest thing yesterday. I just wanted to share this with you, and then uh, we'll close. Yesterday, we were watching these, uh, these training seminars. No kidding. Don't know this guy. Never met him. Heard his name a couple times. His name is Benjamin Burks. He heads up the Reformers Unanimous. Uh, kind of the global outreach. And he's doing these video segments. It was probably, what, five-year-old video. And, and he's talking and he's preaching. He's telling about how important it is to, to help people understand. You know, he's excited. He's passionate about it. Wouldn't you agree? Those who have watched it, he's passionate. He's excited about it. And he says, man, he says, let me tell you what. If you don't know where you're going when you die, he whips this baby out. And I'm like, no kidding. He's going to give me a wallet illustration. I knew it. He says, I want this hand. He used the wrong hand. He said, this hand is you and me, and I was like, that confuses, that's confusing the gospel. <laughs> this hand is you and me, and this wallet is sin in this hand. Get the gospel right. <laughs> you can use either hand. You understand there's, anyway, this hand is you and I, and this wallet is sin, and God loves us, hates our sin. The Bible says that there's a wage for this sin, a payment for this sin, it's death, separation from God. The Bible says that we can make this payment. But we are going to spend an eternity separated from him. That's why God the Father sent a Redeemer, sent Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to pay the sin debt that we owe. It's not about a good work. It's not about a church. It's not about giving money. It's not about raising a hand. It's about what you believe. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Do you believe that by faith he took your payment or took the debt, pay, debt and he made the payment rather. He made the payment for your sin debt. If you believe that, that's what saves a person. It's not what church you go to. It's not what aisle you walk. It's about faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. And when you believe that, when you trust Him that He died on the cross and rose again the third day, He looks at you and me as righteous as Him. That is salvation. That is salvation. If you haven't done that, if you in the quietness of your mind say, Lord, the best in how I believe you died for me. I believe you made your payment, made my made the payment of sin for me on the cross. If you believe that, you'll be saved forever. It's wonderful. What's not to get excited about? Is it the fact that you have eternal life? Is it the fact that you know God personally through faith? What's not to get excited about? Is it the fact that he saved you from all present power of sin? You don't have to get excited about that? If you ask me, that's, that's something to get excited about. He saved us from the presence of sin, the power of sin. He gives us eternal life that we can never lose. So we never have to find it again. He saved us from our sin. I love that. If you haven't done that, simple faith alone in Jesus Christ alone will save you forever. And then we can get excited about something. We can have a start to get excited about something.